questions without notice. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm the household income and labour dynamics in Australia survey released today shows that median household income has decreased under the Liberal National Government? What is the median household income now compared to 2013? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, and I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, what I can tell the Senator um, following the, the, the release of the Hilda report um, is that this government, the Morrison government, is doing everything that we can do to ensure that our economy remains strong. Um, one of the things that we did, the very first thing that we did when we came back after the election in May, was to pass a series of tax cuts yeah, through this yeah. place. Tax cuts that were designed to make sure that people got more money of their own money, money that they earned, left in their pockets. We also um, announced over the last uh, period of time a very ambitious um, order. Senator Rustin, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Simple question: What is the median household income now compared to 2013? That's what the minister was asked. If she hasn't got a brief, perhaps she could take it on notice. Uh, Senator Wong, the minister was asked that uh, about household, household income. Was also asked an earlier question about the data and its trend over recent years. There were two questions, um, and. Uh, the minister is entitled to, to answer either or both of those questions in her answer. Senator Rustin. Hmm. Uh, well, what I actually can, and I've got a great deal of pleasure in advising the House, what the, uh, the Hilda survey did show, um, with the, the longitudinal survey of Australian households over the last 17 years, um, it actually showed uh, that, uh, that unemployment uh, picked up in 2017, particularly for women who saw their employment rate Senator rise. Senator Watt, from... on a point of order. Senator Watt. On relevance, again. The minister, the minister seems to want to talk about everything in the Hilda report apart from what was she was asked about. Can she confirm that median household income has decreased under the Liberal National Government? That's the question. Senator Watt, that, that is part of the question. I do remind the minister there were two parts of the question, both related to household income. Uh, and note that she has a minute remaining to answer. Senator Rustin. Okay. Look, th thank you, thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for Senator Cormann. And the reason that we would be higher than it would be under those opposite is because we weren't actually ripping three hundred and eighty-seven billion dollars out order. of the pockets. Senator Senator Rustin, uh, can I anticipate your point of order, Senator Senator Rustin? Um, I remind you of the nature of the question and ask you to turn to it. Note you have forty-seven seconds remaining to answer. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, I can advise the, this chamber that the average disposable household income rose by five hundred and twenty-seven dollars to fifty-five thousand. Order, Senator Watt. Do, Do we need to explain the difference between Sen median and average? Senator Watt. We asked about median. Well, Senator Watt, it's been a while since I studied statistics, but one median is a form of average. If one uses um, now, order. I think it is, not a rel it is not a point of order on relevance um, to specifically ask for a type of answer. I think in answering that the minister had turned to the question and was being directly relevant. There is an opportunity after question time to debate this. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. But what matters? What matters to the people of Australia is that they've actually got more of their own money in their pockets. What matters to them is that they've got a government that's focused on a strong economy. What matters to the people of Australia is the fact that we are a government with a plan to continue to deliver for them. Uh, so, I think coming in here and giving us a lecture about the economy of Australia when your plan going to the last election was $387 billion worth of more taxes. Uh, I don't know what that part of that was going to make a stronger economy for all Australians, but uh, as I said, the average household Order. income has Senator risen. Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that after more than a decade of decreasing rates of poverty, the Liberal National Government has overseen an increase in the rate of poverty? Shame. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for your follow-up question, Senator. Um, the best way that the Australian government can get people out of poverty is by getting them a job. And we are absolutely focused in creating jobs and creating pathways so that people who want a job can get a job. So uh, one thing that I'd say is you know, the ABS data shows that in real terms wages are growing. In fact, the, wage, the sector wages are growing by 2.4 per cent, uh, the highest since December 2014. Order. Senator Watt on a point of order. 
So we're now getting an answer about wages. This question is actually about poverty. Could the minister just try once this week to answer the Order. question? Um, Senator Senator Rustin, this question did specifically mention poverty. I have said before that the t introduction of the term direct into the direct relevance test narrowed the previous test, and so I ask you to turn to the question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I actually answered in the first part of my question in responding to, to the question was the fact that on this side of the chamber, we understand that the best way to get people out of poverty is to actually get them a job. But not only that, not only that, the best way to make sure that we have got a, com a country that's strong and can afford all of the social services that so many Australians depend on is making sure our economy is strong. And I can assure you, the best way of making the economy strong is not taxing Order. it by Senator 387 Rustin, time billion dollars. Senator has expired. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Professor Roger Wilkins, co-author of the Household Income and Labor Dynamics Australia survey, says, and I quote, in the mid-2005 to 2009 range, we saw very large increases in household incomes. But since 2012, there's basically been no growth. Why are Australians worse off now than when the Liberal National Parties came to government in 2013? Great question. Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually to give you my interpretation of the data, uh, data that was contained in the Hilda report, Order. not somebody else's. Um, and what I'd like to advise the chamber, as I said, you know, women's employment has increased significantly over the period of the longitudinal survey, including in recent weeks and recent years. Um, under the coalition, 1.4 million new jobs and a plan to create more. Female workforce participation is at record highs. So the workforce participation for those over the age of 65 is also being increased. More than 100,000 young people got a job in 2017-18. Senator this Wong, on a point of order. Order, Senator Wong. The uh, question dealt with uh, this proposition that. Between 2005 and 2009, we saw large increases in household incomes, but not since 2012 that there's been no growth. And the minister was asked a question about why there had been, why, why Australians are worse off now than when the coalition came to power in 2013. Now, the minister has had 40 seconds. She's spoken a lot about workforce participation, etc. But this is a question about the trend in household income under her government. Senator Wong, on the point of order, on the previous question, I drew the minister's attention to a very specific question. The nature of the final part of the question that was read out was why are Australians worse off than and it referred to a date. I think the minister is allowed some discretion in being directly relevant to such a broad question in that. Senator Rustin. Hmm. Look, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and in relation to talking about the the incomes of households, uh, it's worth noting that uh, the average living standards have increased over the full 17 years of the period of the longitudinal survey. The average disposable household income rose $527 to $555,000. The largest the increase has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Will the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is demonstrating it's on the side of local communities by getting more Australians off welfare and into work? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And I know this is a very personal one for him, given the fantastic work that he did before coming to this place, uh, in particular in working with communities and getting those who are on welfare off welfare and into work. And I certainly look forward to working with Senator O'Sullivan in this capacity, in this portfolio. Uh, Mr President, as Senator Rustin has already stated to the chamber, uh, the Morrison government unashamedly believes that the best form of welfare is a job. This is a side of politics that actually believes in the dignity of work. And as a government, we have a very, very strong focus on putting in place the right economic framework so that businesses out there can prosper, grow and create more jobs. Almost 1.4 million jobs have been created since we were elected to office. But at the same time, Mr President, we have a very, very strong focus on putting in place the right policies and processes to ensure that those people who are on welfare have access to the policies, the programs and the services they need to ensure that we give them the very best opportunity to move off welfare 
and into work. And in relation to the programs that we have in place, those on the other side, they criticise them and they oppose them at every step of the way. The Youth Jobs Path program, giving our youth who've never had the opportunity to work an opportunity to undertake an internship. Parents Next, ensuring that in particular young women whose youngest child will be going to school, they are prepared for the workforce. And of course, our Rural Apprentices Incentive, which the Labor Party like to criticise at every opportunity that they get. Mr President, this is the side of politics that understands the benefit of work. And we are unashamedly, unashamedly of the belief that the best form of welfare is a job. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Minister, thank you for that answer. Are there any new approaches the government is exploring to improve on these outcomes? Senator Cash. And Senator O'Sullivan, in relation to your question, the answer is yes. Uh, Mr President, the government understands that we need to continue to focus on and deliver better outcomes for both job seekers and for employers. What we are therefore doing, government services, employment services, they are being transformed. This will result, of course, in the delivery of better services to those who are looking for work, but also to those people who provide the jobs for the employers. From July 1st this year through to June 2022, the new model is actually being trialled in South Australia and New South Wales. This is all about ensuring that job seekers who are the most ready to work are digitally literate and they are able to focus to online services, but at the same time allows the government to reinvest back into those job seekers who require more assistance. We are focused on getting people off welfare Order. and into Senator work. Cash. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Could the minister inform the Senate of any broader economic benefits associated with moving people off social ser services payments and into work? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, put quite simply, nobody benefits when somebody languishes on welfare. And that is why, as a government, we have our plan for a strong economy, which we're implementing. You create jobs by ensuring a strong economy. Those jobs are then able to be taken up by people who are on welfare. Again, we unashamedly believe the best form of welfare is a, uh, is a job. And the economy under us has created almost 1.4 million jobs since we were elected to office. But more than that, Mr President, more than that, welfare dependency in Australia under the coalition government is the lowest it has been in 30 years. And as you know, when you get people off welfare and into work, they stop taking from the system as a benefit of welfare and they start giving to the system as a taxpayer. There are so many other benefits to getting people off welfare and into work, and we will continue to Order, focus Senator on Cash. that. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. When classified ASIO advice was leaked in February, ASIO Director General Duncan Lewis said that when, and I quote, classified advice is leaked, it undermines all that we stand for. Given the strength of the Director General's view, why did the AFP discontinue its investigation? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, as Senator Keneally would know, uh, the Australian Federal Police conduct their investigations and carry out their operations independent from government, and the AFP considers this matter finalised. Order. Order. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Oh, you think you've got a halo? Former oh. AFP Commissioner Andrew Colvin said, We didn't actually commence an investigation because we immediately saw the prospects of a successful investigation or prosecution were limited. But given FOI documents released today revealed that only 10 people in the Department of Home Affairs, plus the minister, had access to this confidential advice, does the minister agree the prospects of prosecution are limited? Mm. Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And again, Senator Keneally, I would refer to my previous answer. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary Very question. In response to the leak, Minister Dutton said, and I quote, I haven't leaked anything. The minister also said, and I quote, nobody is above the law and the police have a job to do under the law. That means only 10 people are left. Will the minister now commit to reopening the investigation? Senator Cash. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In response to that question, I would again refer uh, to my answer to the initial question. Order. Order. On my left, Senator Dinatali. Thanks, Order. Mr. President. Order on my left. Order. Senators, Senator Keneally, Senator Dinatali. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. Minister, in recent days we've heard allegations of serious corruption involving two federal ministers and one federal MP pressuring the Department of Home Affairs to allow international high rollers with criminal connections to bring bags of laundered money straight from the airport to gamble at Crown Casino. Minister, who are these three members of parliament, and has the Prime Minister questioned them about their involvement? If not, why not? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, firstly, I would caution Senator Di Natale from uh, what appears uh, to be an attempt to be uh, both the uh, police officer charging as well as the uh, judge and jury and the executioner all at the same time. Obviously, this is a case that the Australian government takes all allegations of illegal activity very seriously. Everyone must abide by the Australian law. This is particularly the case for any members of our law enforcement, our immigration or our customs authorities. And the, um, the Attorney General has uh, announced uh, earlier today, uh, of course, uh, that he uh, will refer um, this matter, this uh, matter that uh, Senator Di Natale has raised in relation to Crown Casino for consideration of Section 18 of the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act 2006 uh, for inquiry. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we are um, not preempting uh, their findings, but the Attorney General has considered the allegations that have been raised in the media order, reporting, Senator and particularly. Di Natale, on a point of order. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I kept the preamble uh, short, and the question was very specific. I asked uh, who were the three members of parliament and whether the Prime Minister had questioned them I about their involvement. I, I, I remind senators, um, the preamble may have been short, Senator Di Natale, but the minister is being directly relevant to the question as asked. And I'm going to start asking senators to not simply use points of order as repeatedly a chance to restate a preferred part of the question. By all means, highlight it, but at least make a link to direct relevance, please, not just restate a preferred part of the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. President. I mean, I, I answered a very specific question yesterday where in relation to visa processing. Uh, I pointed out that there's actually no discretion uh, in, in relation to the application of laws in relation to assessments of uh, character, health and various other uh, relevant grounds. But as, as I was about uh, to indicate to the Chamber, the Attorney General, General considered the allegations that have been raised in the media reporting, and particularly as they touch upon allegations which are either directly relatable to or potentially relatable to Commonwealth officers, and it, has been, it was his view that there are sufficient concerns raised to warrant further investigations, which is why he's referred this matter to the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner. Uh, in the circumstances, it wouldn't be appropriate, of course, uh, for um, me to make any further comments in relation to these matters. Uh, that is now uh, obviously a matter for Ackley to further consider. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Well, you're right, Minister, and uh, the Attorney General has indeed requested that the Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity uh, examine this case, but we both know that they don't have the capacity to investigate politicians. Minister, hasn't it been referred to Ackley specifically because they can't investigate politicians? Minister, isn't this just more evidence of a protection racket for ministers in your government, and isn't this why we need a national anti-corruption watchdog? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I reject the premise of the question. But, and I would just point out that in relation to visa facilitation, the Department of Home Affairs has absolutely no evidence of visas being rubber stamped or of requirements being waived for visa applicants supported by Crown uh, Casino. No waivers to Australia's visa requirements have been provided. Departmental officers apply the same legal criteria to all visa applications in accordance with the Migration Act. There is no discretion for officers to depart from these requirements. Visa applicants' individual circumstances are assessed against all legal requirements, including in relation to national security, character and health, 
No one is exempt from these requirements. In relation to uh, the integrity of Australian Border Force and Visa staff, all staff are expected to uphold the highest standards of integrity and professionalism at all times. A range of controls are in place to prevent, detect and respond to internal fraud, corruption and serious misconduct. Uh, the Acting Secretary is aware of allegations of inappropriate conduct by an ABF officer. Uh, it would be inappropriate Order, for me to Senator comment Corman, on the matter. time for the answer has expired. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, well, in the past, Liberals, it must be said with the support of the Labor Party, have joined to shut down uh, inquiries into uh, money laundering, tampering with poker machines, um, covering up abuse within their own premises. Minister, isn't the reason that you've shut down these inquiries and again have not referred this to the appropriate channels because Crown Casino donates hundreds of thousands of dollars to both parties and employs former ministers like Minister Coonan and Arbib as Order. an insurance Senator policy Natale. against Time scrutiny. Time for the question has expired. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely, completely reject the premise of this question. I completely and utterly uh, reject the premise of this question. Um, Obviously, and I also I reject the proposition that no appropriate action has been taken. The Attorney General, of course, as I've indicated, has referred these matters uh, to the uh, Australian uh, Commission on Law Enforcement and Integrity. Senator Patrick, or Senator Bernardi, on a point of order. President, yes, I, I have a point of order that um, uh, Senator McKim is being very disorderly and interjecting, and it's even more disorderly because he's not in his own seat. I ask you, if, could you ask him to go back to his own seat so he could interject appropriately? or to cease and desist? Uh, well, it would be inappropriate for me to ask someone to interject appropriately. Um, there should be uh, no interjections and people should seek to make contributions from their seat. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the shareholder minister for ASC, Senator Cormann. Minister, did you not tell the Senate FBA Legislation Committee on 23 May 2018 that no decision had been made to shift Collins-class submarine full cycle dockings from ASC in South Australia to WA. If no decision had been taken by government, why then did Admiral Samet, head of the submarine program, uh, write on the 29th of D September 2017 to advise Naval Group that in designing the future submarine construction yard at, at Osborne, they should assume, and I quote, the land occupied by ASC submarines would be made available to Naval Group following this 2024 FCD to allow for further development of the submarine construction yard inclusive of access to the Port Adelaide River. Minister, is ASC aware of Admiral Samet's written advice that the land they occupy for Collins full cycle dockings has been promised to Naval Group from 2024? Senator Cormann. Much, uh, Mr. President. Well, firstly, uh, I'm not personally aware of uh, what uh, the quote that you've uh, just uh, read out, um, but um, I, will, I will ask ISC whether they are aware of the, the quote that you've just read out. But what I can say substantively is that, is that I absolutely stand by what I said in Senate estimates uh, at the time, and that is that no decision has been made uh, in relation to. Uh, full cycle docking for the Collins class submarine. Uh, we, the government is seeking expert advice, which is, I think, something that I've confirmed during Senate estimates as well, to inform options associated with full cycle docking. Uh, given uh, you know, the significant additional uh, workload and the 12 attack class submarines uh, that will, of course, uh, be built in, in um, years to come, uh, as a result of decisions, the $90 billion in additional investment that we are making under, under our government, um, so no decision has been made, and I've again uh, discussed these matters, of course, uh, with uh, Senator uh, Reynolds in more recent times. Uh, you know, we expect uh, that uh, this is a matter that will uh, come uh, for a decision to government later in the year. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, if, uh, if no decision of government has been made, how is uh, Admiral Samet promising the, yard, the, the, the site to Naval Group for, uh, for its construction yard? I mean, this is a serious move. Uh, there, there will be significant costs involved. There will be the depletion of corporate knowledge. Don't you think that this uh, move can be simply ruled out on the basis it will harm national security? Senator Cormann. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, because we are so focused on our national interest and in making the right decisions uh, by the Australian people, the public interest and our national security interest, uh, that is, of course, why we are going through a proper process, and that is why we are uh, seeking and obtaining 
appropriate expert advice. And uh, again, I mean, I substantively stand by what I've previously said, and, um, and that is that no decision has been made. Uh, ultimately, this will be a cabinet-level decision. Uh, this will be a cabinet-level decision taken in the national interest uh, in the context, of course, of a historic record uh, investment in our defence uh, capability as a nation moving forward. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, in an FOI uh, asking for the incoming uh, government brief uh, relating to shipbuilding for defence, there's a secret sealed section that hasn't been released to me entitled Western Australia. Uh, what secret uh, deal has been done? I know that Minister Order. Price and Minister Reynolds and yourself are from WA. Has a promise been made to the WA government that full cycle dockings will go to South Australia? Senator Sorry, Cormann. Well, the answer to the last question is no. Um, now, um, but in, in relation to the other matters, I'm not the Minister for Defence, uh, so it won't surprise you to hear that I haven't had access to the secret seal section uh, either. <laughs> but uh, I can also inform the Senator that the great state of Western Australia is part of the Commonwealth of Australia and, and that, uh, thankfully, the, our defence forces are quite focused on defending the great state of Western Australia as part of its commitment to our national uh, defence and our national security. Uh, so I'm, sure, I'm, I'm very relieved that uh, our defence forces are focused on what is required uh, to be done to keep uh, Australians in Western Australia safe and secure. Uh, in the same way as of Senator course, Patrick, they... on a point of order. Point of order uh, is a simple question: Have you done a deal with the government of Western Australia to shift it to uh, shift full cycle dockings there? Senator Patrick, you restated the last part of your question. The minister, I understand, had addressed that at the start and was being directly relevant to the remainder of the question. Could not have been more explicit and more unequivocal. There has been no deal. We are making these judgments uh, on, uh, based on the national interest. No decision has been made. We will make the decision not on political grounds but on national security and public interest grounds. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. In March this year, the Minister's, le the minister's leader in the Senate, Senator Cormann, explained the wages growth is low under the government's watch because, and I quote, that is a deliberate design feature of our economic architecture. Minister, does it remain the Morrison's government's policy to see wages stagnant? and household incomes go backwards in real terms. Order. The, order. the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Giacconi for the question, uh, and I reject the premise of the question. Uh, but what this government does understand, and in particular what Senator Cormann, as the outstanding Minister for Finance, who, along with the Treasurer uh, and now Prime Minister, will deliver a surplus budget, which is something that goes on the other side, Mr President. They have not seen for many, many decades. The one thing Senator Cormann understands is that the way that you do lift wages in Australia correct, as he said, is to have business be more successful. Because as our colleagues know on this side, when business is more successful, they create more jobs for Australians. And when there order. are more jobs— Senator Watt, on a point of order. I'm sorry, but again, on relevance. Order. I'll call Senator Watt when I can hear him. Senator Watt. The question was very clear. Does it remain the government's policy to see wages stagnate and household incomes go no. backwards in real terms? Senator, That's the question. Senator Watt, it's a broadly, very broadly worded question. Order. This is time for the opposition. If it stops interjecting, I'll make a ruling. Senator Watt, it was a very broadly worded question. I consider the minister to be directly relevant if the minister is talking about wages policy, and I believe she was at that point. Well, I'm listening very carefully. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And as I was saying, what Senator Cormann does understand is that governments need to put in place the right economic framework so that businesses can prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, which is exactly what this government is doing. Since we were elected to office, we, the economy under us has created 
almost 1.4 million jobs. We now have record employment in Australia. We also have participation, the participation rate in Australia, at a record high for the second month going. And, Mr President, what we will never do to the Australian people is take more money out of their pockets, because that is exactly what the Labor Party were going to do. They talk about slow wages order. growth. Senator Cash, Senator Watt, on a point of order. Are we going to get one answer about wages today, Mr President? Because we haven't had it here. We haven't had it from I, Senator Rustin. So I take it you're raising a point of order on direct relevance? Again, I ask senators to draw a point when they make the point of order. Senator Cash, you've been reminded of the, of the, of the question. Um, you've got 30, 28 seconds remaining to answer. Mr President, I rejected the premise of the question outright, and I said what Ms. Senator Cormann does understand, just all of us on this side understand, is that the way you increase wages in this country is by having a strong economy, because one of the benefits of a strong economy is the creation Order. of more jobs. When the economy creates more jobs, exactly, there's less unemployment, and guess what? There is competition for the jobs that are actually out there, which ultimately puts Order. pressure on Senator wages. Cash. Senator Ciccone, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. After almost six years of stagnant wages growth and a flannery economy under your government's watch, why do you continue to support cuts to penalty rates to some of Australia's lowest paid workers? Senator Cash. Well, Senator Ciccone, I know you weren't here in the last parliament, and we're going to have to Order. now go through this again. Order. Senator Ciccone, on, on, order. On my, order. On my left, one of your colleagues is on his feet seeking a point of order. S Senator Wong. Senator Ciccone, on a point of order. I was here in the last parliament, so I was here in March. <laughs> Senator Cash. Wonderful to have you standing up and asking a question then, Senator Ciccone. Uh, but you would then recall that uh, the decision to actually cut penalty rates in this country was a decision of the Fair Work Commission. Now, the Fair Work Commission, and in particular the president of the Fair Work Commission, uh, was actually appointed, Senator Ciccone, by your former leader of the opposition, uh, Mr Bill Shorten. And in fact, Many uh, Labor Party members have been part of unions, Mr. President, that have done deals with big employers to cut penalty rates of the relevant employees. Uh, so I completely reject the premise of the question, Mr. President. We on this side are focused on growing our economy because when you grow the economy, you create Order. more jobs, you lower unemployment, and that is how wages will ultimately rise. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary order on my left. Senator Ciccone, a final Thank you, Mr. President. Question. Why are Australians worse off now than when the Liberal and National parties came to government in 2013? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Again, Senator Ciccone, I completely reject the premise of your question. Uh, almost four million Australians, Mr. President, have now lodged their tax returns. And do you know why they've done that, Mr. President? Because the first thing, the first piece of legislation that we pass when we're elected to office is the tax cuts that we took to the election for the Australian people and the Australian people voted for. They will always be better off under a coalition government, and in particular when it comes to employment. Because, Mr President, on this side of the chamber we understand. It is employers that create jobs, not governments. We put in place the economic framework, and the economic framework under us is leading to a stronger economy. More jobs for people who are out there putting their hands up and saying, we want to work. Order. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. The Australian agricultural industry is leading the world in innovation and providing best practice in efficiencies, technology and sustainability. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is demonstrating it's on the side of our local farming communities? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. With this side of the chamber, we are excited about agriculture. The beef industry, the lamb industry, the rice industry, the dairy industry, the horticultural industry. We recognise the huge opportunity to grow Australian agriculture to reach its potential, despite the current challenges, because our farmers are world class. We're a government who is on their side. 
who wants to enable them to do what they do best, producing the very best food and fibre in the world. Agriculture drives rural and regional economies and supports local communities. It drives our national prosperity, and it always has. Supporting farmers is not just in the national's interest, it's actually in the national interest. Today the Senate passed the Farm Household Allowance, and since our victory on May 18, we've already delivered on our election commitment and secured the $5 billion future drought fund in the face of resistance from those opposite. We are progressing our tough new penalties to help protect farmers from the real threat of activists invading their farms, damaging their property, stealing their animals, harassing and intimidating their staff. Farmers have the right to farm and to feel safe, and workers have the right to go to work and be safe and free from harassment and intimidation. Because this side of politics recognises that farm invasions are more than civil disobedience, Senator Di Natale, through you, Mr. President, and Senator Rice. We know that farmers are terrified and some have been driven from their industry. We're making sure uh, that we're no I mean, what the Greens want to see is that we're actually no longer farming in this country. We're only farming vegan produce rather than farming livestock. I'm sorry, your senators said it. Your senators said it here uh, and outside of this place that they do not want to see the farming of livestock. This side of politics wants to see more farmers in local communities, not less. Order. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. What are the specific steps the government is taking to ensure the agricultural industry hits its $100 billion target by 2030? Senator McKenzie. Well, as announced recently by the Prime Minister in Dubbo, our government is backing Australian agriculture's uh, desire to grow to $100 billion industry by 2030. The National Farmers Federation says it's possible and it's a goal worth fighting for. Our total farm production has already increased by around 25 per cent over the last six years and will drive further growth through getting more of our agricultural produce to overseas markets, strengthening biosecurity that underpins Brand Australia, which is so valuable to that export proposition, reforming our research and development and innovation sector, making sure that the $1 billion investment we do make uh, as a federal government finds profit at the farm gate ensuring connectivity and making sure there's an appropriate skilled workforce available when and where our farmers need it. We want to make sure our farmers succeed and that rural and regional communities that depend on agriculture succeed with them. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline any risks associated to the prosperity of Australian farmers? Senator Mackenzie. Well, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Uh, Senator Macdonald. While we have sided with farmers from day one, those opposite support for farmers has been lukewarm at best. Some would say it's colder than a Canberra winter. Sorry, Senator Stirl, through you, Mr President, it actually has. There's a, co there's a um, phrase that the press gallery has been using about those opposite response to the government's agenda. It's about complaining, complaining, making a noise and then at the end of the day voting for the proposition. So, we would seek that you actually support our agenda rather than bitch and moan about it. Now, when Labor is given a chance to side with farmers and stand up to activists, we get more of the same flip-flop. Our message is just get on with it. Save us all. Save us the heartache. Save our ears from bleeding. Just If you're going to vote for our legislation to support farmers, absolutely say it at front up and get on with it. Australian public sent a strong message at the ballot box, and that was to back our regions. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, a constituent wrote to me about their experience living on Newstart. I quote, I'm 59 years old on Newstart, living in a tent with my two dogs because I can't afford to live anywhere else. Another one wrote to me, saying, My husband is nearly 64. I'm 61. We are both on Newstart. Life is tough going through our savings. We deserve better. Minister, if an increase in new start is off the government's agenda, what is your response to these people struggling to get by on new start? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Seward for her question. Um, no one has ever said it would be easy to live without a job. Um, but one of, the things, one of the things that we have said as this government is that our very highest priority is to say to anybody who is living on Newstart 
that we will do everything that we can and in the power of this government to get them off Newstart and to find them a job. We've never said, we have never ever said that Newstart was supposed to be a wage or a salary replacement. We have never said that. It is a safety net. And in Australia, we enjoy probably one of the, the strongest safety nets when it comes to our social welfare system of any country in the world. But this social welfare system is funded by the taxpayers of Australia, and we have an obligation to the taxpayers of Australia to make sure that we continue to manage it in a sustainable way. And this extends to the responsibility to those taxpayers because we must never forget in this place, we must never forget in this place, governments do not have money. Only taxpayers have money, and the taxpayers make available through their taxation the money that we use for our very comprehensive social welfare system. But my absolute focus as the Minister for Families and Social Services is just to make sure that this system is both fair and sustainable, so that for anybody in Australia, anybody at all in Australia who finds themselves in a situation where they need the support of their government through taxpayer funds to look after them in times when they need a little bit of help, that our system is sustainable not just today but sustainable into the future. So future generations will always know that that safety net exists for them should they find themselves in hard times. So to anybody out there who is on Newstart, you can be absolutely assured that the highest priority of the Morrison government yeah. is to create jobs Order. but also I remind senators that even interjections can't use unparliamentary language. I'm not sure if I heard correctly, but just be careful about interjections as well. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. In June, there were 159,700 job advertisements. There were 711 500 unemployed workers. How can you get a job when there aren't enough jobs? How is that sustainable? Senator Rustin. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things I'd probably point out um, to, to Senator Seward is that the creation of jobs has been one of the great success stories of this government. 1.3 million new jobs. But I suppose one of the most pertinent points in the creation of these new jobs is a lot of them have actually been the creation of full-time jobs and not part-time jobs. And we've seen a significant movement of people out of part-time work into full-time work. And the, the, the agenda that we went to this election with was a government that had a plan to create more jobs. And it is absolutely incumbent on any government to create jobs, and a strong economy creates jobs, because a strong economy creates jobs which allows people to be able to get off New Start and to, to get into a job. So I think that our track record in terms of job creation, our plans for, for job creation into the future, um, send a very strong message to the people who are on New Start, people who um, are, are doing it tough, and, and we recognise that. Senator Rustin. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Um, through you, President, to the Minister. Um, Minister, have you or the government, the Liberal Party, had any discussions with the National Party about their proposal to link an increase to New Start to the cashless debit card or income management? Can you categorically rule out that any increase that you may, in your heart, decide to give will not be linked to the cashless debit card? Senator Rustin. Hmm. Well, look, thank you, thank you very much, um, Senator. Um, what I can assure the Senator um, is that the policy of the coalition government in relation to, to New Start and our focus on finding people a new start a job has not changed. I can also advise the senator that in relation to the cashless debit card, which is being currently trialled in four sites, and I thank you very much for your continued engagement in making that program as, uh, as good as we possibly can and better uh, than it already is, um, I can assure you that our policy in relation to the benefits that are being delivered to the communities that are currently being trialled in the cashless debit card uh, has not changed either. We believe that the benefits that have been generated in these communities with lower incidence of alcohol and drug abuse, lower interests of domestic violence, the fact that children are now attending school, um, I think are a very, very strong points why this government should continue to pursue uh, the benefits of the cashless debit card, but at the same time our overarching policy is always to create more jobs for more Australians. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. In 2016, the Fair Work Ombudsman report 
into the widespread theft of wages at 7-Eleven found that the level of penalties and the limited investi investigative powers contributed to an environment of non-compliance. How much has the government reduced wage theft since the Ombudsman's report three years ago? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I have some information from the, from the Minister here in those aspects of Senator Sheldon's question, which I can't answer directly. I'll take on notice uh, and return to the Senate with uh, further information. But uh, it is fair to say, Mr President, that um, the coalition government has made it uh, quite clear that uh, we don't have any tolerance for exploitation in Australian workplaces, and we have taken definitive action to protect vulnerable workers. Uh, in relation, for example, to the Migrant Workers Task Force, we accepted in principle all 22 recommendations of that and, were, and are building on measures already introduced to protect vulnerable workers. In our 2019-20 budget, uh, the government also committed uh, over $10 million, almost $11 million, to enhance the capability of the Fair Work Ombudsman to crack down on uh, law-breaking by unscrupulous businesses. And that's on top of the coalition having provided the Fair Work Ombudsman with greater powers and over $34 million in funding over the past couple of years to focus on protecting vulnerable workers. Uh, that increase in funding will allow the Fair Work Ombudsman to continue to level the playing field for law-abiding law employers by taking strong action against those who exploit their workers. It also means the Fair Work Ombudsman will be better able to meet the information and the education needs of both migrant workers and employers, ensuring the migrant com worker community uh, also better understands their workplace rights. Mr. President. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. This month it has been revealed that jewellery chain Michael Hill has underpaid workers up to $25 million over the last six years. Why has the government allowed continued wage theft from Australian workers? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And the government would, of course, reject that sort of exploitation of workers, as I said, right at the beginning of my first answer, Mr President. And we continue to work with the uh, Fair Work Ombudsman and encourage and support the Fair Work Ombudsman in their efforts to address these very serious issues. Uh, in fact, Mr President, it's worth noting, it is actually worth noting that uh, the the point at which the Labor Party left office in 2013 saw the Fair Work Ombudsman's funding cut by 17 per cent, their staffing by 20 per cent. So we have increased that, Mr President. As I said in my, in my answer to the first question, we have increased that to enable the Ombudsman to continue to level that playing field, as I said, for law-abiding employers to ensure that we can take strong action against employers who do exploit their workers, like the example that Senator Sheldon made. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Why isn't addressing stagnant wages, decreasing median household income and rampant wage theft a priority for this government? Senator Payne. Well, I agree with uh, Senator Cash. I absolutely reject the premise of uh, Senator Sheldon's question because it is ridiculous to suggest that in delivering a stronger economy as this government is doing, delivering the levels of job creation that this government is doing, delivering the personal income tax um, benefits that this government is doing, we are absolutely focused on supporting the workers in this country. I reject the premise of Senator Sheldon's question. Order. 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 Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Could the Minister please update the Senate on the government's priorities in enhancing Australia's relationships in the Indo Pacific region? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I thank Senator, Senator Askew very much for her question, because this government recognises that Australia's values and interests are best served by an Indo Pacific region that is open and prosperous and inclusive and where the rights of all states are respected. And to help promote those goals, I am travelling this week to uh, attend ASEAN related foreign ministers' meetings in Bangkok, Mr. President. 
The Association of Southeast Asian Nations has an absolutely central role in supporting a rules-based regional order. It's helped to underpin regional stability and prosperity for over 50 years. And Australia is ASEAN's oldest external partner. We are celebrating 45 years of diplomatic relations, and the government remains absolutely committed to strengthening our engagement with ASEAN. Both the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum provide opportunities to bolster what are already strong and growing economic ties. Our two-way trade relationship with ASEAN countries last year was worth $121 billion. These are fora which present Australia with opportunities to register our views on a range of regional security and diplomatic issues, including the important denuclearisation of the Korean Peninsula, uh, stability in the South China Sea and both the regional and human rights challenges of the Rohingya crisis and, of course, countering terrorism and violent extremism. We warmly welcome the adoption of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, Mr President. It's a statement from ASEAN that sends a very powerful signal about the member countries' commitment to international rules and norms and strengthens ASEAN's position at the centre of the region's most important architecture. So, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to take up these meetings this week and also to meet with uh, a number of counterparts in a bilateral uh, context to further commit to our deepening relationships in the region. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Could the minister advise how Australia will use the ASEAN Australia post-ministerial conference to further Australia's priorities with ASEAN? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Askew for her question. Uh, we will be co-chairing with Malaysia the ASEAN Australia post-ministerial conference, uh, where I'll be able to discuss our shared commitment, as I said, to enhance relationships, including through support for ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific. It is a chance for us to welcome agreement on a new ASEAN Australia plan of action, which will cover 2020 to 2024, and also to advocate for ASEAN Australia leaders' summits, which is a priority for Australia. The post-ministerial conference will give us a chance to update our counterparts on regional initiatives that complement Thailand's focus as the 2019 ASEAN chair, including on connectivity, on cyber and on border management. It's a very valuable opportunity to highlight the strength of the ASEAN-Australia relationship and to progress implementation of the outcomes from the very successful 2018 ASEAN-Australia Special Summit, which was held in Sydney. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Could the minister also advise how Australia is working with ASEAN partners to counter transnational crime? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And that is a very important question. Countering transnational crime is one of Thailand's key priorities, and they are the current ASEAN chair. And as part of the, uh, the visit this week, I want to be able to demonstrate our strong, our strong support for uh, that issue. So, as well as co-sponsoring a proposed East Asia Summit leaders' statement, uh, there will also be some important announcements that I'll be able to make on Australia's behalf. I'm going to co-host a joint ministerial launch of the new ASEAN Australia counter-trafficking investment with Thai and. Malaysian counterparts and the ASEAN Secretary General. That will enable us to highlight Australia's status as a very valued and long standing partner for ASEAN and what is our shared commitment to countering human trafficking as well as other transnational crimes. I also look forward, Mr. President, to announcing a new investment which targets transnational crime in the Mekong sub region. Because our priority is to work with our regional partners, those I've named and others, to enhance border security and to counter transnational crime through that strengthened Order. cooperation. Senator, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. In May, Anastasia McArdle, the mother of Bruce McArdle, who was in receipt of a disability pension until he died in November last year, received a call from a Centrelink officer and was told her son, Bruce McArdle, owed a debt of $6,744.52. Ms McArdle has said, and I quote, I wanted to know how they thought Bruce would have worked through his way through his paperwork when he was actually dead, end quote. What advice can the minister give Ms McArdle? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Look, um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Um, obviously, it would be inappropriate for me to make any comment about an individual case in this place. Um, however, 
um, I am more than happy to take the matter on notice and provide uh, the senator with a response after I've had discussions with the minister responsible for the Department of Human Services, Minister Robert, in the other place. Um, however, I will not be making any public comment about a particular case in this place. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have a first supplementary question. Ms. McArdle has said that the Centrelink officer, and I quote, made out that I was responsible for those payments. End quote. Does the minister consider Ms. McArdle is responsible for payments made to her deceased son? Senator Rustin. Well, um, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I do refer to my answer to the previous question. I am more than happy to take the matter on notice and discuss it with my uh, my colleague in the other place, Minister Robert. Um, it, because I, I don't believe it's appropriate for me to stand in this place and, and make a comment on a particular case, on an allegation that you have made, but I'm more than Order. happy to take the matter up with Ms McArdle Order. directly. Order. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr question. President. The government's robo-debt scheme is seriously malfunctioning, with inaccuracies, cruel enforcement measures and a lack of human oversight. When will the government stop targeting vulnerable Australians and admit its harsh and unfair robo-debt scheme has failed. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thank the, the senator for follow-up question. Um, without being specific about any particular cases which I have indicated that I will not be prepared to do, broadly speaking, as the Minister for Social Services and the Minister for Families and Social Services, my focus is not on debt recovery. My focus is on two things. One is to make sure that my policies are developed in such a way as people don't incur debt in the first place, but also in providing a fair, a fair and sustainable system, social welfare system going into the future. Uh, and this also includes ensuring that people get what they deserve. Uh, and what they are entitled to. So when somebody does receive a payment of which they are not entitled, there is a reasonable expectation in this place and a reasonable expectation in the wider Australian community that we will recover that debt. Now, in certain circumstances, in certain circumstances, there is an argument where we are more than happy to speak to individuals who have specific circumstances to Order. assist them Senator through Rustin, difficult time times. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Oh no, sorry, Senator McMahon. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia. Could the Minister update the Senate on any recent developments that could deliver further development of the gas industry and support local communities by ensuring long-term gas supply? The Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator McMahon for uh, that question and uh, recognise her strong interest in seeing the Northern Territory develop. Um, I know as a, as a regular traveller to the Territory that it has been a difficult couple of years uh, there, uh, particularly in Darwin with the wind down of the very large IMPEX uh, project. And, the federal government is doing everything we can to bring new investment to the Northern Territory and more job opportunities there. That's why it was great. It is well, it is great news that last week the Northern Territory government provided its first approvals for drilling in the Beetaloo Sub Basin, which is a part of the larger Macarthur Basin, one of the most exciting uh, opportunities, resource opportunities in this nation. Uh, it is very exciting because it's the, Australia's first major shale oil and gas play in Australia. And many of us would have seen the uh, great opportunities that have been provided in the United States as a result of the, the development of their shale resources. Uh, we have not yet developed any shale, any major shale resources here in Australia, but this first one could be very exciting for our nation. The Beetaloo Sub Basin, uh, our geologists estimated as, as big as the Permian Basin in Texas, which has underpinned their resource development. And while there is still a lot of work to be done in exploring and assessing the quality of this resource, a lot of people are very excited. So it's great to see the Territory Government um, doing that. It's got great opportunities, not just for the Northern Territory as a whole, but also to the local industries in this region uh, around that area, 
around the Daly Waters area. I caught up with the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association this week, who I recognise are in, I think, the, uh, the, the gallery today, Chris North from the NTCA. Uh, and we need to make sure that any investment that comes from this exploration also benefits that industry as well in terms of better infrastructure, greater opportunities, more jobs, a greater critical mass in our north, and uh, of course cheaper energy as well. Before I come to you, um, I'd just like to acknowledge former Senator Bohm in the gallery. Welcome back to the Senate. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. What is the gas potential of the Northern Territory and how will this important industry create more jobs in the top end? Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, people smarter than me have estimated that something like 178,000 petajoules of a gas is potentially there in the Beedaloo Basin. What does that mean to lay people like myself and probably most of the people listening or watching at the moment? Uh, that means about 200 years of supply. So around 200 years of East Coast supply is potentially there in the Beedaloo Basin. It's a huge, huge resource. Estimates are that there would be something like in the order of uh, 6,500 jobs. It will have a real income impact of $2.8 billion for the Northern Territory and around $9 billion for Australia as a whole. And I want to play up here that it's not just the benefits of the Northern Territory. Uh, there are potentially liquids in this basin as well, and we haven't really exploited a major liquid fuel basin since the Bass Strait in the 1960s. We've had got declining liquid fuel security, and opportunities just like this are essential to help us secure our energy needs for Australia and secure the safety of our nation as well. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you. What more can be done to meet Australia's long-term gas needs? And reduce gas prices for Australian households and businesses. Senator Canavan. Well, uh, Mr. President, the best thing that can be done is get more supply. We want to get energy prices down. We've got to get more supply uh, of gas or electricity or whatever the uh, particular target may be. And that's what I am focused on as a resources minister: is to increase supply of these resources. That is why the federal government has supported. Uh, the development of the Beedaloo Basin with an $8.4 million investment uh, to help facilitate the approvals and ongoing works there in that region. That's something we announced in the last few months. We've also signed a memorandum of understanding with the Northern Territory Government to make sure we work together uh, the development of these re this resource for the benefit of Australia. In particular, uh, we would love to see the development not just of a gas, oil and gas industry onshore in the Northern Territory, but also the use of that oil and gas in places like Darwin, where there's enormous potential to grow a manufacturing industry there with the fantastic Asian-facing port they have there in the Northern Territory. It's a very exciting development that the federal government is working in lockstep with Northern, Northern Territorians to see development of their Senator interests. Canavan. Senator Cormann. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Rustin, Cash and Pine, and to the questions asked by Senators Walsh, Ciccone and Sheldon. Now, early this afternoon, uh, a number of us senators had the pleasure of asking uh, ministers across the bench about the uh, the state of our economy and also about the word that the government continues to uh, refuse to use. And I know uh, Senator White also made mention of it a couple of times in his uh, points of order, which is wages. Now, I just want to set the record straight about wages in Australia. Wages growth nationally has been at or below 2.5 per cent for almost the last five years. Real medium household incomes have declined by almost $500 in the latest year, according to the Hilda survey released today. Percentage of the population living in relative poverty has increased to 10.4 per cent, and more than one million Australians are underemployed. But on top of that, we have over 700,000 Australians who are underemployed, and youth unemployment is at a staggering 12 per cent. And to top all that off, Madam Deputy President, penalty rates continue to be cut under this government's watch. And as a former uh, union official at the SDA, I know that the cuts to penalty rates have had a major impact on many retail workers, and especially those in the hospitality sector that I know a number of other senators in this place had also previously represented. 
And those costs may not be a lot for many people in this place, but I know it does matter to many of those members and retail workers where they've lost between two to six thousand dollars every year. Now some will argue that is good. It is good for business because it will allow employers to employ more people. But recent research from the University of Wollongong shows the complete opposite. In fact, the number of shifts that have been offered under the recent cuts to penalty rates has not produced any extra jobs. In fact, earlier this year, the, small, the Council of Small Business, the chief executive, Paul Strong, described the cuts to penalty, to penalty rates as a waste of time, stating that not one single job will be created. So, some will also argue that the world is changing and that's becoming increasingly normal to work on Sundays. But surely the argument in favour of a robust and competitive um, environment and providing compensation to workers is something that must be reflected, especially when you are doing irregular hours outside of the normal Monday to Friday nine to five workplace. Now, regardless of what will be argued, and no doubt there will be others that will argue against this, but for those who do work on Sundays and rely on those penalty rates, they cannot survive. They definitely do need the lost wages that they uh, were earning before the 2017 Fair Work Commission decision. Now, to top it all off, we've also had the Reserve Bank of Australia recently also come out and say that our economy uh, is weak. Wages are stagnant, consumption growth is weak, and this has resulted to a sluggish growth in the economy under the coalition's watch. To quote the central bank, wages growth has remained at record lows and the GDP growth has been well below trend over the year to the March quarter. Now, these are one of the other reasons the RBA has quoted. Growth in household disposable income has remained low, and this has contributed to low growth in consumption, which was also well below average. So we've got the Reserve Bank of Australia also stating the obvious. Wages are low, the economy is slow, and yet the government on the other side seems to think that there is no issues on how things are tracking. The RBA has also remarked that the growth in business investment was also, quote, weaker than expected, and that retail and transportation sectors had experienced well below conditions. The government has vacated the field when it comes to fixing this mess, and it's made the mess thanks to the policies set by the now Prime Minister and also former Treasurer. Madam uh, President, on top of wages growth or stagnant of wages growth, our unemployment is also not looking to crash hot. Uh, earlier this month, uh, figures released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics show that both unemployment and underemployment remain too high. Economic growth is slowing, and serious structural issues in the labour market continue under this government, with increase in insecure work soaring unemployment and growing levels of youth employment to top it off. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, your time has expired, Senator Ciccone. Uh, Senator Seselja. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and it's great to be able to respond to uh, the motion by Senator Ciccone. And uh, I wanted to uh, pick up a couple of the points that he made. And I, I thought that it was extraordinary coming from a Labor senator uh, that he would decide that he wanted to talk about unemployment, uh, because we know what the record of the Labor Party has been, uh, not just when they were last in government, but the time before that and every time they're in government. What we see is unemployment going up under the Labor Party and unemployment coming down under coalition governments. And we've seen that again uh, in recent years. We've seen strong employment growth under this Liberal National Government. Now, it hasn't been helped uh, by the Labor Party and those opposite. Uh, we haven't been helped in our quest to grow the economy, whether it's uh, free trade agreements, uh, whether it is cutting taxes, whether it is cutting red tape for small business, whether it's things like instant asset write-off. On most of those measures, it must be said, on most of those measures, we have had either resistance or downright hostility from the Labor Party. We saw their attitude when it came to tax cuts. I mean, they talk about middle income earners, middle income families working hard. And what is the Labor Party's attitude to middle income families? Well, uh, they think they should be paying more tax. 
And we saw that during the debate uh, in this place, in the House of Representatives, uh, we saw the approach, the sort of Vicar of Dibley approach from Mr Albanese, the no, 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 yes approach, where they were against them until we had the numbers in the Senate and then they were in favour of them. That's the Labor Party's view of cutting taxes for middle income earners and middle income families. It is no, 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 yes. When, we, when did the yes come? The yes came when we had 39 votes here in the Senate and they thought they might jump on the bandwagon and didn't want to be voting against something that was going to go through anyway. But in their heart of hearts, they don't support middle income earners. And as they've been reflecting on their election loss, and the disaster that was their election campaign, uh, there have been more sensible voices in the Labor Party saying, gee, maybe, maybe we didn't understand the aspirations of Australians. Maybe we didn't understand that when Australians go and they work hard and they sometimes make $80,000, $90,000 a year, $100,000 a year raising a family, that in fact those people are not rich. Those people are not rich, uh, Madam Deputy President. They are, in fact, hard-working Australians trying to get ahead for their families. And what is the Labor Party's prescription? What did they take to the community for them? Uh, well, higher income taxes uh, for those who have saved for their retirements, paying uh, more tax when it came, uh, came to the retiree tax. But I want to focus on one aspect that I don't think has got enough attention. And one of the reasons, and if you look at the analysis of who particularly rejected the Labor Party, uh, whether it's in places like Queensland or in other parts of the country, it was in many low and middle income uh, households and seats with many low and middle income earners and in fact a high proportion of renters. And I wonder why that is. Because one of the other approaches of the Labor Party when it came to middle income earners and middle income families was to increase rents. They went to the people of Australia with a tax on houses which would have seen the rents of ordinary working Australians going up. No, well, it's not rubbish. Senator Billick can say it's rubbish all she likes, but every analyst when it came to Labor's housing tax pointed to higher rents would have been the outcome. And uh, SQM, I think, who did some of the numbers, went city by city as to what we would have seen in terms of increases in rents. Uh, and we saw it across the board. In fact, uh, in Perth, rents under Labor's policy would have gone up $73 a week. In Brisbane, $91 a week. Uh, in Darwin, uh, we would have had $15 a week. In Melbourne, $65 a week. $50 a week extra in Sydney, $56 in Adelaide. $44 a week extra in Hobart and in Canberra around $56 a week. That was the prescription of the Labor Party. Higher taxes on income, higher taxes on capital such as housing, higher taxes on those who have saved for their retirements. That doesn't help middle income earners. It doesn't help people get out of poverty. All it does is it crushes their aspiration. It sees less jobs. Every time the Labor Party is in government, less jobs, a slower economy, higher taxes uh, and ordinary Australians doing it tough. So we're not going to be lectured to uh, by the Labor Party. Uh, wages growth is starting to pick up and it's starting to pick up through a range of factors uh, which we've been working on. There is more work to do, but the prescription of $387 billion Selgy, of higher taxes is not there. Um, Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin, Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Families Businesses, Senator Cash, and the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne, though not necessarily in order of their cruelness, ineptitude or dismissive attitude of the struggles of Australian workers. Why do I say that, Deputy President? Let me go to the Smith family, a very well-known uh, charitable foundation that looks after people who are, have disadvantaged circumstances. On their website, they detail individual cases, and they've got some about some of the children in Australia and the disadvantage in which they're living. From the moment they are born, there's an increased risk of disadvantaged children, and the case I'm going to read out is one of Alice, who fall through the cracks. They often miss out on early learning experiences and opportunities that others other children receive. When they start school, they're already behind. One in three children from Australia's most dis disadvantaged communities
do not meet one or more key de developmental milestones when they start school. When they start school. Not all children get an equal start in life. Alice is just one of one in six Australian children who are living in disadvantage today. Some families have experienced many generations of disadvantage. For others, there might be a more recent change in health, employment or family relationships, which has affected them so badly they are no longer able to meet the daily costs of living. With limited financial resources, the day-to-day -day life of a family changes significantly. If the parents are working, they are more likely to be working irregular hours in insecure work, which we know under this government, under it, and in the last, its last two terms, and in this it's the beginning of its third term, they are more likely to be working irregular hours due to insecure work or travelling long distances for work. This puts pressure on other family members, including children, to keep the household running. So let's think about that. That's a child, a primary school age child like Alice, who is having to help keep a household running. Teenagers may have to work to supplement the family income, leaving them little or no time to study, and no one there to help them if they're struggling with schoolwork. Why? Because again, their parents are working long, irregular hours. With so much focus on just getting by, many of these kids don't have something as simple as a school bag, a complete uniform, the school books they need to make the most of their education. School excursions and activities become an impossible luxury. This singles them out amongst their peers and they also have to deal with that, that the fact that their ch other children that they're at school with know that they can't go on the school excursion. They're often teased or left out by other students because they don't fit in. We now have the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia survey released today showing that household medium income under this six-year government has flatlined. Yet instead of looking at ways to increase the real wages of working Australians, this government is more comfortable going back to their pet loves of attacking unions and low-paid workers. The Hilda report noted that since 2012 there has been basically no growth, no growth, and this comes after a period preceding which saw very large increases in household incomes. There has been basically no growth in household income. Day after day, in every appearance, we see this government engage in, they tie themselves in knots trying to defend the systematic rotting of workers' incomes and entitlements. We've seen recently, in the last few years under this government, an increase in wage theft. So we've seen it with Domino's Pizza, Pizzas, Michael Hill Jewelers, 7-Eleven, and we've seen it with the Lush Group, Lush Cosmetics Group, the Super Retail Group, and of course, more recently and infamously, George Columbaris, who uh, it finally took this government $7.8 million in un unpaid workers, in title, in workers wa wages to actually consider that, yes, a $200,000 penalty was a bit light on. But let's remember also, and I'll finish with this, Madam Deputy President, Scott Morrison has declared when he was Treasurer, record low wage growth is the biggest challenge facing Thank the you, Australian uh, economy. Senator Kitching, your time has expired. Senator Fiavanti Wells. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to respond to some of the comments that have been made, and in particular to some of the comments that Senator Kitching has made in relation to the household income and labour dynamics in Australia, the so called Hilda survey. Can I remind those opposite that since the election we have delivered on our promise to build a better tax system and provide more tax relief to hardworking Australians? Not only have we delivered immediate tax relief for more than 10 million Australians, but we've also provided structural reform that, that tackles the thief of bracket creep that is good for the economy, for jobs and for confidence. And we have been focused on job creation. Can I just say that uh, since we've come to government, 
As Senator Cash uh, reminded the Senate earlier, we have delivered more than 1.3 million jobs have been created since we were elected, which is about 240,000 jobs a year, compared to just 100 or just over 150,000 on average during the time when those opposite were in government. Now, uh, we know um, that this is the Hilda uh, survey uh, is a longitudinal study of Australian households, and it's been following the same households and individuals uh, every year since 2011. Now, there are some very important points that have come out of, of this year's survey. It shows that employment has picked up, especially for women, um, and it's been the highest level ever since the survey. And as I've indicated uh, in relation to job creation in our economy, um, that has also, when you drill down into the survey, shows that the female workforce participation is also at a record high, and so is participation of those over aged, uh, aged 65 and over. More than 100,000 young Australians got a job in 2017, and this is the best financial year result on record. Now, this survey shows little net change in income uh, inequality. It also finds that reliance on welfare is substantially lower. And indeed, uh, under the coalition, welfare payments as a share of the working age population are the lowest in a generation. It shows that the proportion of the population below the relative poverty lines have fluctuated over time, but in broad terms they are trending uh, downwards. And this is especially true since 2017, when over 12 per cent of the population was in relative poverty, and by 2016 the proportion in poverty had fallen to 9.6 per cent. So it's quite hypocritical of those opposite to come in here. And as uh, Senator Sezelja uh, reminded us of the record of those opposite, now, those opposite just can't quite accept that they lost the election. And why did they lose the election? They lost, they lost, they lost the election because the population rejected the dud policies of those opposite. You went to the election on a negative gearing uh, policy, where you, where you were somehow asserting that ordinary Australians on $85,000 was somehow the top end of town, the classic labour, um, classic um, uh, class warfare. How, uh, the franking credits, when you were going out there to hit hard-working retirees, the assault on the coal industry. No wonder that in New South Wales the swing against Joel Fitzgibbon was the largest interstate, almost 10 per cent because of what you were doing. And of course, um, the quiet Australians, that silent majority, they rejected your dud policies. They remembered the six years of fiscal vandalism when you were last sitting on the Treasury benches. And they were not prepared, not prepared to give you the Treasury benches again because of what you were proposing. So that's why. And one only has to look at Senator Sezelja referred to the disasters. Well, let's look at some of those disasters. In some seats, you got swings of five to ten per cent. Hello? Does that not tell you something? Does that not tell you that the recipe that you were offering the Australian public was the wrong one, and that's why they voted to return the coalition to government? Thank you, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. Uh, this is not my first speech. Well, in 2015, as reported in the ABC, sweatshop on every corner, 7 Eleven underpaid by substantial amounts of money and paying as little as $10 an hour. A student from India with three degrees, Mr. Pendham, came to Australia in 2011 and worked at three different stores under four franchisees in the Gold Coast region. Pendham still has nightmares from his time working at 7-Eleven, as reported, where he worked long shifts of up to 16 hours without a proper break, 
He was robbed twice in the space of 18 hours by a man in a balaclava brandishing a long serrated knife. Both times his boss scolded him for not fighting back to stop the robber taking $180. He says, I should fight or do you know or throw the till at him? Something, punch him. Why did you give him the money? He calls his boss saying. Pendham was paid $10 an hour at one store, $14 an hour at another store, which was well below the award rate of more than $24 an hour, including not being paid penalty rates. At the time, the Turnbull government said that this was a deplorable act, Senator, uh, Employment Minister Senator Cash said it was a deplorable act in the Sydney Morning Herald. On the 13th of June 2017, she said the Turnbull government is providing the necessary resourcing and policies to ensure that it is not repeated. Again today, no tolerance for exploitation. Yet we've seen $25 million stolen by Michael Hill jewellers. We've seen chefs, celebrity chefs, steal $8 million. Another celebrity chef, nearly $1.6 million just for one year. Wage theft is rampant under this government. And what that means, because they have a law for everybody else, they have another law for workers. If you walked into your business, you walked into the safe or in that till that Mr Pandem talked about and stole $10 or $20 or $50 or $25 million, you would be in jail. You would not be allowed to run a business. You would not be allowed to work. You would be taken out of society. You would be held to account. But this government, after time and time again declaring it was serious about wage theft, including today, they have done so little it is rampant. It is now a business model under this government. Poverty in this country is on the increase. And of course, insecure jobs, poorly paid jobs, jobs without rights. In this country, $6 billion in superannuation is owed. In New South Wales alone, over $2 billion is owed to people in underpayments and non-payments of superannuation. Shame. Billions upon billions of dollars. Where's the insuring integrity bill for wage theft? Where's the insuring integrity bill for Michael Hill jewellers? Where's the insure integrity bill for Caltex? For Domino's? Where are our billions of dollars that have been stolen out of this economy by people that are thieving and stealing from people in this economy? Australians work hard in this country. They on the other side mightn't think that because they're worried about the people that turn around and steal the money. They're the ones that are turning around and saying they are not going to hold them to account. They're the ones in saying that the business model won't be broken under our watch. Well, quite clearly, this government is about a culture war and to be lectured about a class war. What sort of class war when you take billions upon billions of dollars away from people in this country? That's a class war. What's a class war when you turn around and say to working Australians that your representatives are the ones that are the problem? Not us. Not the people we're defending, not the business community, those ones in the business community that are stealing, that are also robbing from decent businesses, from those many of hard working business people out there that pay the right money, that turn around and pay superannuation. Where are they? What's happening Thank on you, their watch? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Ciccone be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of an answer given by Minister Cormann. Well, in uh, recent days, we've heard allegations of the most serious kind, allegations of uh, blatant corruption uh, involving members of this place, uh, two ministers, uh, one federal MP. Uh, we heard from the former Border Force Commissioner 
that he was encouraged by members of parliament to help fast-track visas and airport entry into Australia. Uh, that was entry for people uh, who were known as international high rollers, people with bags of cash that they can spend gambling at Crown Casino. Allegations of money that was being, that's been laundered, allegations of people who have very clear connections to criminal syndicates. So just think about this. What we've got is an allegation that members of this parliament were pressuring officials to fast track the entry of criminals into Australia so that they could gamble at Crown Casino. We've heard allegations that they made pit stops on the way to Crown Casino for sex workers, for drugs. And again, these are people who have been facilitated into Australia by members of this government. Those allegations are being made by very senior members of the department. You think about that and compare that to the treatment of innocent people who have committed no crime, who come to this country seeking protection, and people who are facing persecution and torture. We say they're not welcome here. We turn our back on them. Worse still, we lock them up, we incarcerate them, we torture them. And yet what we're saying to people who are connected to international criminal activity, welcome to Australia. Show us your money and you're in the door. We'll make a pit stop to, as well on the way to the casino to indulge you because you've got some cash in your wallet. Well, it is everything that stinks about politics in this country. And today, to the great shame of the Labor Party, they backed in the Liberals. They backed in the Liberals by refusing to support an inquiry that would uncover what is going on with ministers of this government. We saw the Attorney General refer this off to the Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. Well, how convenient. How very convenient refer this off to a body that has no mandate to investigate the activity of ministers of the Crown, refer this off to a body that can't look at some of the most senior public officials in the country, try and take the heat out of the issue, send it off to a committee, make sure that they, don't, they can't look at where the action really is and hope that it disappears off the front pages. Well, we're not going to let that happen. We are going to pursue this until people who are responsible have answered questions. If there's any more evidence that's required for why we need a national anti-corruption watchdog, this is it. We need a national anti-corruption commission with broad-based powers that can call in people to investigate these matters. But instead what we've got? We've got the closey club. We've got the protection racket being run by both sides of politics. And Crown are smart about this. Of course Crown is smart. What do Crown do? They recruit people from both sides of politics. Crown is the retirement home for former Labor and Liberal members of parliament, where if you're a Labor or Liberal minister, you're put out to pasture on a good paddock at Crown Casino, out there spruiking for the industry as an insurance policy, so that when this, these sorts of allegations come up, what we get is silence. What we get is a diversion, the classic bait and switch tactic that we saw earlier today. Hardly a surprise. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from the gambling industry funneled into the pockets of both sides of politics. What do you expect? Great investment. I don't call that a bet. I call it an investment. Investing in both sides of politics so that they can continue to do what they do without scrutiny or transparency. Well, this is a dark day in Australian politics. Again, what we see is everything that's wrong right now with both sides running a protection racket for an industry while Order. ignoring Senator vulnerable Dina people. Tally, the question is the motion you move be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKenzie.